Oh, it says I need permission to record. That's weird because everyone should have permission. Uh, okay, I gave you permission just now. All right, I'm going to start. All right. Hi, everyone. This is Divya Menon, and I'm going to be your moderator um, today. And um, let me just see. I want to introduce Platypus and then introduce each of you panelists and then introduce the panel. And then we'll have about 10 minutes for your opening remarks and then about two to three minutes for you to respond to each other as panelists before we dedicate um, a good chunk of time for audience Q&A. That's just the structure of the panel. Um, this is a panel presented by Platypus Cambridge. Um, a little bit about Platypus, the Platypus Affiliated Society established in December 2006, organizes reading groups, public fora, research, and journalism focused on the problems and tasks inherited from the old left, the new left, and the post-political left for the possibilities of emancipatory politics today. If you'd like to be included on our email list or get involved in our activities in Cambridge, please sign up in the sign-up sheet that I will drop into the chat. And now to introduce our panelists in the order they'll be speaking. First, we have Paul DeMarty, who is a member of the Communist Party of Great Britain, an organization that fights to unite the left around a program of open Marxist politics. He's a regular contributor for the Weekly Worker with particular interest in technology, culture, and the failure of liberalism. Next, we're going to hear from Paul Brynes, who's written on Marcuse, Lukács, and Korsh. For 10 years in the 70s and 80s, he was book editor of uh, Telos. He taught modern European intellectual history and lesbian and gay history at Boston College from 1975 to 2010. And presently, he lives in the South End Roxbury area of Boston. Uh, speaking next, we'll have uh, Alex Steinberg, who's an independent scholar and instructor at the New Space for Pluralistic Anti-Capitalist Education, the Brecht Forum, and the Marxist Education Project, where he teaches Marxist philosophy, Hegel, the dialectics of nature, Heidegger, and Nietzsche. Alex has written against the demonization of the Frankfurt School, a trope that is popular among right-wing circles, but also has echoes in the left which he says doesn't necessarily make him a booster of critical theory. His main interests in this area have been with Marcuse and Eric Fromm. And finally, we'll hear from Tom Connell, who's a union organizer with SHARE, A-F-S-C-M-E, um, the American Federation of State- State, County, County. Municipal Employees. Thank you. At uh, different times in the past 40 years or so, he's been active in the British Labour Party, the Democratic Socialist Organizing Committee, and the Democratic Socialists of America. Um, before we turn to our panelists for their opening remarks, I just want to read our panel description. Back in the autumn of 2010, the New Left Review published a translated conversation between Theodore Adorno and Max Horkheimer, causing quite a stir. In the course of their conversation, Adorno comments that he had always wanted to develop a theory that remains faithful to Marx, Engels, and Lenin, while keeping up with culture as it, at its most advanced. Adorno, it seems, was a Leninist. As surprising as this evidence might have been to some, is it not more shocking that Adorno's politics and the politics of critical theory have remained taboo for so long? Was it really necessary to wait until Adorno and Horkheimer admitted their politics in print to understand that their primary preoccupation was with maintaining Marxism's relation to bourgeois critical philosophy? This panel proposes to state the question as simply as possible and to ask, how did the practice and theory of Marxism from Marx to Lenin make possible and necessary the politics of critical theory. So now I will hand it over to Paul DeMarty for opening remarks. 
Okay, uh, hello everyone. Um, I just like to start by thanking the Platypus Comrades for the opportunity to speak. Uh, it's been a while since I did one of these, and also the excuse to go back and read some Frankfurt School stuff, which um, I haven't done since about 10 years ago. That was mostly in a coffee shop called Boston Tea Party, so I'll just pander to the home crowd for a moment there. Um, but I'll also have to kind of apologise for the talk I'm here to give, because first of all, I'm not in any way an academic specialist in the matter. If you listen to the biographies of my esteemed co-panelists, I'm definitely the minnow in the pond here. I'm a computer programmer and I'm a communist with a sort of electristic streak. Um, more gravely, um, there is that question of the last question there, how did the practice of theory of Marxism from Marx to Lenin make possible and necessary the politics of critical theory. But in my view, this question is strictly speaking unanswerable. It is so because the title of the panel is somewhat misconceived. There is not such a thing as a, politi as a politics of critical theory, the politics of critical theory. So then the question of Marx, Lenin and Co is simply mute. They could no more have made possible and necessary the politics of critical theory than they could have made a plank of wood into a string quartet. Critical theory is rather, in essence, a philosophical project and tendentially became more so over time until perhaps Habermas inherited the brand. Uh, political thinkers may absorb philosophical materials into their proposals as both Marx and Prussian chauvinist conservatives did for Hegel and indeed as many people have with critical theory. Um, but the space of that mediation is vast and all the larger, the more interesting the philosopher. For a concrete illustration of my position, I'd actually like to take a barred remark of the doorknobs that Martin Heidegger's philosophy is, quote, fascist to its very core. This phrase, which I think is from the jargon of authenticity, but it was a while ago, uh, might, in, might be interpreted more loosely as saying something like um, any attentive reader of Heidegger's philosophical writings would not be surprised to learn that he was an enthusiastic Nazi. And Adorno goes to great lengths to demonstrate this in that book and negative dialectics and others. On a strict interpretation, however, the statement is just obviously false. The evidence is empirical. Those who took up core elements of Heidegger's philosophy include the communist John Paul Sartre and the young Marcuse, of course, the liberals, Emmanuel Levinas, Rudolf Bultmann, Jacques Derrida, Hannah Arendt, the neoliberal Michel Foucault, uh, the politically unremarkable hermeneuticalists of Gadamer, the Kerr. Um, Gadamer has did teach during Nazi Germany unmolested, so maybe suspect, but only Heidegger has a real record of like enthusiastic Nazism and anti-Semitism. So if Heidegger's philosophy was truly fascist through and through, he has been bizarrely misunderstood by almost every significant thinker to take after him, including many who explicitly take up the problem of Heidegger's political affiliations. How can this be? Merely that attaching questions of epistemology and ontology to political practice is, as the cliche goes, like nailing jelly to the wall, or jello, for the Americans. Um, it was not until relatively recently, with the publication and stages of Heidegger's personal papers, that the full extent of his anti Semitism and Nazism was revealed. But it can't seriously be argued that that thereby invalidates the work of Derrida, Sartre, and so on. If Heidegger's intention was to create an ontology that was necessarily Volkish nationalist, then he simply failed. So, at last, the Frankfurt Institute for Social Research. In its early days, its focus was more on social research, sociological analysis, often of an empiricist stripe, which was funded by the uh, sort of inheritance of a bourgeois class renegade. Its products were of interest to empirically minded social democrats and communists. Critical theory is, properly speaking, the name given to what resulted from the turn towards philosophical concerns, aesthetics, and so on, inaugurated by Max Horkheimer and colleagues in the 1930s. Already then, it was a retreat from politics, from the direct kinds of analysis which feed into political activity, and reflect, uh, reflected unease with the concrete political choices on offer to Marxist intellectuals in the early 1930s. Um, uh, so, from the great touchstone of Hegelian Marxism, Georgi Lukács, Horkheimer and Adorno inherited many concerns, but perhaps above all, the apocalyptic register. For the young Lukács, the proletariat was nothing less than the solution to the riddle of world history. The identical subject object, the missing piece in Hegel's system. By 1930, however, the revolutionary alarm was fading a little, and Lukash confronted a with Europe on the brink of barbarism and the enforcing contingents of the workers' movement seemed almost deliberately to refuse to fight. In Germany, the communists decided that the social democrats were a greater evil than the Nazis. The social democrats, for their part, blocked with Hindenburg, who then invited Hitler into power. In this situation, Lukash 
diverged far from the strident leftism of his younger days. And likewise, the catastrophe of Hitler's rise cemented the philosophical character of the Frankfurt School's critique. For good or for ill, it led them away from direct engagement in politics, first of all by putting them to flight to the United States, and having done so, demanded an account of how the retreat from politics could be justified, could have been made possible and necessary, of how the moment for the realization of philosophy had passed. It's because they made that turn that we have critical theory at all. This is true quite apart from the peculiar interactions in the New Left Review. These discussions don't express a huge amount of the essence of critical theory any more than Heidegger's private diary entries about Jews express about his phenomenology. The informed reader of Dialectic of Enlightenment, for example, will recognize the Marxian conceptual apparatus, just as um, an informed reader of being in time will recognize the kind of imagery associated with Volkish nationalism. Um, but by sublimating Marxism into philosophy, the connection with politics is obscured. This is, if anything, clearer with the dawn of Horkheimer than usual. We are left with a critique of modernity on the basis of the oppressive rule of instrumental reason, when politics is precisely instrumental reason par excellence, a regime of calculation like war, where five deaths are better than ten, and what does the business is the right mark, as Francis Bacon is disparagingly quoted at the beginning of that. This is quite as true for communists as it is for conservatives or even for pacifists. A provocation of Adorno's to his old friend Horkheimer about staying true to Lenin is not Leninism by any definition. That would involve at least joining a party, submitting to its discipline and fighting for its program. Anything less than that, and we merely reduce Lenin to an empty stereotype of a kind of man of action, which is sort of what Zizek was doing 20 years ago. On the other hand, a good loyal communist by the standards of the 1940s or 50s could not have produced anything with the tragic depth of the dialectic enlightenment or negative dialectics. The proof of this gap was unbridgeable is merely that no new manifesto was produced after these discussions. What could it have said about politics, lacking the assumption of the old manifesto that there were political tasks immediately before its authors? Fully half of the communist man manifesto concerned immediate strategy, political demands, and criticisms of rival trends. I conclude then, having said very little about the text of critical theory themselves in the short time I have available, I instead offer a warning against grafting it onto some political tradition, or worse, doing things the other way around and reducing, I use the word deliberately, Marxism to a philosophical critique. The political hopelessness of Adorno is in some ways preferable to the optimism of the Yomgi Wutash. The critique of Hegel's identity of system and dialectic in the early part of negative dialectics, I think, applies very fundamentally to the arguments of history and class consciousness and to get to the real problem with them. Um, but to suppose that it has a uh, politics in the strict sense, which is to say an impulsion to collective coercive action is mere projection, even when Adorno does it himself. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And next we'll hear from Paul Brynes. Thank you very much. Divya, and thank you, Kevin, uh, for all the work you did in putting this together. And it's very nice also to meet my co-panelists. Uh, Paul DeMarty, I thought that was really interesting. And for somebody who is a mere computer programmer and not uh, immersed in theory, um, you seem pretty, uh, pretty adept. And I, I, I liked a lot of what you said. Um, especially raising the theme toward the end of your remarks about um, the retreat from politics, because to me that was one of the uh, most appealing things about the Frankfurt School theory when I got attracted to it in the, uh, in the 1960s. Um, but let me start out with the, uh, the key question that, uh, that you also challenged, Paul, I think very adeptly, the panel proposes to state the question as directly as possible and simply to ask, how did the practice and theory of Marxism from Marx to Lenin make possible and necessary the politics of critical theory? Parenthet instead of being very direct, let me interject parenthetically that uh, I, I, taking off from the point that Paul raised about uh, what the po questioning the notion of critical theory having a politics in certain respects, it seems to me that the Frankfurt School theorists, in the case of the Frankfurt School, Frankfurt School theorists, um, the politics of critical theory was critical theory. That is, they, they did not have the politics of 
joining an organization, as Paul suggested, uh, being uh, actively involved in struggles against um, capitalist exploitation and reification. Uh, the politics of critical theory was everything that the critical theorists wrote uh, and uh, not a politics that was connected to um, Lenin or social democracy or any other, um, to tip, any other political organization. Uh, I think the, the, the theme I'd like to start out with is that um, if we think of critical theory, the work of the Frankfurt School theorists as an advance in the development of broadly speaking Marxist theory, um, the thing that becomes interesting to me is the way in which some of the greatest advances in the development of Marxist theory and perhaps practice um, emerge from failures of revolution, emerge from defeats, emerge from serious blows to the Marxist project, beginning with uh, the, Marx's experience and Engels's experience in the 1847, 48, 49 period, the defeat, the collapses of the 1848, as they came to be called, revolutions, which Marx and Engels believed were revolutions that started out as anti-monarchical and basically bourgeois revolutions, which would be pushed toward uh, a working class revolution uh, by the working classes. Uh, as the revolution unfolded. I mean, it was almost as if Marx by 50 some years anticipated uh, Lenin's and Trotsky's notion of permanent revolution. But what happened was that those revolutions went in a very different direction from the one that Marx anticipated. And George Lichtheim, the historian may have been right. I think he was that Marx, perhaps Engels, but certainly Marx, conflated what Lichtheim calls the birth pangs of capitalism with its death throes. And uh, that produced, with the collapse of the 1848 revolutions, that disappointment uh, produced some of the great works of Marxism. It came out of a defeat, not only the 18th Brumaire of Napoleon Bonaparte that Marx wrote, but um, capital. Capital was an attempt to make sense of the crushing of a revolution. And I think something similar happens with the, with the Paris Commune in 1870, Marx's essay on the Commune, trying to make sense of the defeat of this revolution. <clears throat> so if you would think, go back now to the, the question, how did the practice and theory of Marxism from Marx to Lenin, presumably that means Marx through Lenin, including Lenin, make possible a necessary critical theory, leaving aside for a moment its politics, but critical theory, um, it seems to me that the, the, um, the transformation of the Leninist project into the Stalinist project and the collapse of the proletarian revolutions of 1917, 18, and 19 across Europe as well as Russia, and the, uh, what is, was it? I don't know if, I guess, the shocking failure of the international working class to prevent the outbreak of world capitalist imperialist war in 1914 um, gave us a lot of things. The Soviet, in, in terms of the development of important theory, uh, Trotsky's revolution betrayed, for example, was an interpretation of a defeat and a collapse of a revolutionary project. Lukacs's history and class, class consciousness, which Paul DeMarty uh, discussed, I think very perceptively, uh, as I see it, was, was itself an interpretation of a defeated revolution, of the collapse of the revolution, both in Hungary and uh, in Italy, uh, and, and um, in part in the, in the uh, Workers' Councils movement in Germany. Um, and the Frankfurt School, the, which, which began, came out of the early 1920s, the Frankfurt School's perspective uh, was similarly an interpretation 
of a defeat of revolution. So that the, 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 um, the practice and theory of Marxism from Marx to Lenin and was in certain respects a, a gigantic failure, uh, which the Frankfurt School theory uh, was, it was made possible and necessary because that failure had to be, had to be accounted for. Um, let me make a couple of remarks on, um, on the, the, uh, the prompt that, that um, Divya read in the beginning. There are some features of it that are kind of interesting because the, the, the uh, piece that, that she read out in the beginning moves along in such a way, there's this in the middle sentence, Adorno, it seems, was a Leninist. And by the end, when we get to the question, how did the practice and theory of Marx and of Marxism from Marx to Lenin uh, make possible the necessary and necessary the politics of critical theory? The assumption there is somehow that the politics of critical theory were Leninist. And I think that is um, a very difficult proposition to uphold. Um, one of the things that I think would be interesting, it's interesting that those who see the Frankfurt School, as this prompt suggests, as that their politics was Leninist or that Adorno was a Leninist. There's a very interesting essay uh, that was written in 1941 by Horkheimer called the Authoritarian State, Autoritaire Stadt, which was published in English translation in Telos magazine a number of years, decades ago. Uh, that position, the position that's laid out in authoritarian state by Horkheimer is radically anti-Leninist. It's very much in the spirit of the workers' councils version of proletarian revolution. The, the, it, it, it almost, it could have been written as, as in my reading of it by somebody who was involved in the, in the workers' councils movement, not in, in a Leninist uh, organization. So there are, and it's also an odd notion because there's so little reference to Lenin um, uh, in the Frankfurt School's writings. And I, I don't, um, let me, so I think that, that wanting to keep the notion of uh, Adorno as a Leninist or the Frankfurt School uh, theory as their, that their politics was a uh, Leninist uh, would have to account for, for Horkheimer's essay, Authoritarian State, which um, is, is not necessarily the politics of the Frankfurt School. It's one piece of it, but it certainly is, it's not explicitly anti-Leninist, but it's indirectly against the idea that being part of a powerful organization uh, is, is something that's necessary for emancipatory politics. <laughs> It's also oh, notable that in the, I'm sorry, am I 10 minutes up? No, I was just saying you have a couple of minutes. Remaining. Okay, I'm just gonna say that, that um, the first three sentences of the prompt, which end with the dramatic sentence uh, of, of uh, Adorno, it seems was a Leninist. Uh, those first three sentences could have been written, it seems to me by, uh, writers in the alt-right or even in QAnon who have argued that yes indeed Adorno and the Frankfurt School were Leninists. They were tools and instruments of the Third International. Uh, Martin Jay has written about this in his in, in his the essay uh, The Dialectics of Counter Enlightenment, the Frankfurt School as a whipping boy or the Frankfurt School as yeah as a whipping boy for uh, the lunatic fringe. But the idea, so there's a kind of odd agreement between uh, this apparently left-wing notion that the enthusiastic notion that Adorno was a Leninist and the, uh, the alt-right kind of notion that the Frankfurt School is responsible for the attempt to overthrow um, the Western values and, and Christian values and institutions. And that is kind of these two uh, notions meet with the, the, the idea that Adorno was a Leninist. It's a great thing, apparently, from this prompt. Adorno was a Leninist as a horrible thing uh, from the standpoint of the right wing. Um, 
So I think it's uh, it, uh, it, the uh, I, I, well, obvi- I probably is obvious that some of my, if I have any value in this discussion, is that of the four panelists here, uh, I'm the one who probably has moved uh, furthest away. I don't think any of the other panelists may have moved away at all from what broadly could be called the Marxist project. Uh, I don't connect to that uh, much at all anymore, but uh, that may make me useful in this in this panel. So thanks for the opportunity to lay these thoughts out. Thank you, Paul. Um, our next speaker is Alex Steinberg. Alex, you might want to unmute yourself. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, it's an interesting topic for discussion and it led me to an, <clears throat> an area I had not looked at in quite a long time and something that I was not even aware of and that's <clears throat> Horkheimer's discussion of Lenin's materialism and imperial criticism. So let me let me begin. Uh, the question of whether Adorno and Horkheimer were Leninists is not in itself particularly interesting. The obvious response is that it depends on what you mean by Leninism. It's actually more interesting to me that the question is even being asked, given the demonization of the Frankfurt School that we have witnessed in recent years. That demonization is primarily a right wing, I would even say a fascist trope about the debilitating influence of what is called cultural Marxism on traditional Western values. Its origins date back to the 1970s as part of a reaction against the cultural and political movements of the 1960s. And it is of course still with us. What is surprising however, is that this right-wing conspiracy theory also has an echo on the left. In recent years, the Frankfurt School, borrowing some of the arguments first articulated by Alan Bloom in his 1980s work, The Closing of the American Mind, has been accused of sowing the seeds of postmodernism and distracting students from the real class issues of the day and seducing them into an obsession with sex and psychology. The upshot of this left-wing inversion of a right-wing trope is the accusation that Marcusa and others were responsible for turning an entire generation away from class issues that really matter toward identity politics and a self-centered concern with one's subjectivity. Uh, I won't go into any of that today as it has been adequately dealt with elsewhere by a number of authors such, such as Martin Jay, as well as myself, I might add. So it's interesting that the question of Adorno and Horkheimer's relationship to Lenin is even being asked. The point of contact between the two is obviously, and this is to me obvious, it's certainly not the politics because I don't see that much in common there, but it's the concern that both the Frankfurt School and Lenin had with what we now call mass psychology. Lenin was not a theorist in this area, but he had an implicit understanding that you, if you're going to affect a fundamental change in class society, then you must become sensitive to the changing dynamics of mass psychology. To illustrate the point, take this quote from Lenin, written in 1908 after the defeat of the 1905 revolution, when Marxists were concerned with the question of when the next revolutionary upsurge might break out. And this is Lenin. It is indubitable that without the general groundwork of an agrarian crisis in the country and depression in industry, profound political crises are impossible. But if the general groundwork exists, that does not permit us to conclude whether the depression will for a time retard the mass struggle of the workers in general, or whether at a certain stage of events, the same depression will not push new masses and fresh forces into the political struggle. To answer such a question, there is only one way, to keep a careful finger on the pulse of the country's whole political life, and especially the state of the movement and of the mood of the mass of the proletariat. Keeping a careful finger, that's the end of the quote, keeping a careful finger on the mood of the mass of the proletariat is precisely a definition of mass psychology. 
It is the same concern that was addressed not only by the critical theorists of the Frankfurt School, but also by the left Freudians. Trotsky too voiced his concern with the mood of the masses. He went even further than Lenin by acknowledging the importance of psychoanalysis in this area. The exploration of what he referred to as subjective dialectics in his philosophical notebooks was something that he saw as of paramount importance in the practical work of building a revolutionary movement. The commonality of concern, therefore, between Adorno and Horkheimer's critical sociology and Lenin and Trotsky's concern with mass psychology can perhaps be clarified if we concentrate on one particular encounter between Horkheimer and Lenin. I am referring to Horkheimer's critique of Lenin's 1908 work, Materialism and Imperial Criticism. Horkheimer's essay on Imperial Critic Criticism, written in 1928, was never published during his lifetime and was uh, unknown until 1985. To make sense of this, a little historical background is necessary. In the period after the 1905 revolution and its defeat, a number of Russian Marxists became influenced by a philosophical wave that was partly a reaction to the pessimism of the time, but also a reaction to new developments in science. This was a period in which incredible advances were being made in physics, not the least of which were Einstein's special theory of relativity and the origin of quantum theory. <clears throat> the latter in particular had a destabilizing effect on traditional conceptions of the natural world. The fact that particles were also waves, that matter and energy were interchangeable, that atoms, which since the end of the 19th century were supposed to be the most fundamental building blocks of matter, and indeed the very name means something that cannot be further divided, actually consisted of more elementary particles, electrons, protons, and neutrons. All of this had the effect in the popular imagination that matter disappears. In addition, there was also at this time the work of the physicist Mach, who articulate, articulated a philosophical viewpoint that today would be called operationalism and anti-realism. Mach defined reality by its relationship to the observer and considered that the traditional goal of science, the search for objective truth, was a meaningless phantom. Mach's ideas served him well as it allowed him to go beyond the limitations of the mechanical philosophy that characterized Newtonian physics. He was in fact one of the pioneers who pointed toward the theory of relativity that Einstein was to formulate more systematically in 1905. <clears throat> Einstein in fact leaned on arguments borrowed from Mach's operationalism in his popular presentation of his theory of relativity. Later in life, Einstein became very critical of Mach's philosophy. Mach's influence led a number of Russian Marxists, Bogdanov being the most prominent, to repudiate materialism altogether and argue in favor of a new philosophy called imperial criticism. Lenin felt that this turn against material, uh, materialism represented a mortal threat to the revolutionary movement in Russia and was inspired to write a book long polemic against it, thus the birth of materialism and imperial criticism. Since its publication, this work has had many admi admirers as well as a number of sharp critics. It has been accused of presenting a non-dialectical form of materialism and a vulgar form of epistemology. Horkheimer and his critique of Lenin's work was one among many who made these criticisms. And one has to say that insofar as Lenin presented an epistemology that consisted of a non-dialectical copy theory of reflection, that is the idea that there is an unbridgeable gap between being and consciousness and that our conceptions of the world are basically copies of the world that this criticism was justified. However, those criticisms often miss the larger picture. Lenin was unique, not only among Marxists, but within the philosophy of science itself, as pointing out that a commitment to materialism should not depend on the particular form of matter that is articulated by the natural sciences at any point in its development. 
this has been recognized uh, as a pioneering uh, conception by, among others, Paul Feyerabend, and more recently, Adam Becker in a book on the history of quantum physics. Horkheimer, to his credit, also recognized this, and while being uncompromising, in his critique of Lenin's undialectical epistemology, concedes that his contribution to the philosophy of science and therefore to a consistent materialist outlook was more important. One has to also take into account that Lenin was not a professional philosopher, but is motivated to defend materialism as part of his struggle to build a revolutionary movement. And he recognized that this demanded an ideological struggle against a backward philosophical tendency. Horkheimer gives credit to Lenin for seeing the limitations of the static view of materialism. He wrote, this, this is a quote, the absolutization of individual phases of the scientific project of knowledge leads to static metaphysics, to the denial of the existence of truth, to relativistic agnosticism. According to the materialist view, every true theory, in spite of all errors and relative imperfections has in a dialectical way, an objective and incomplete share in the transsubjective absolute truth in, <clears throat> in so far as it is a necessary moment of progress in knowledge for through it, we produce not only appearance, but we get closer to an exact image of reality. Horkheimer later elaborates that every theory is subject to correction through practice. This dialectical view distinguishes Lenin from those materialists who regarded definite views on atomic structure, etc., as final. While Horkheimer correctly pointed to Lenin's contribution in this area, he made one error, which perhaps says something about the limitations of Horkheimer and of critical sociology as a whole. What I am getting at is Horkheimer's remark that the philosophy of Mach and imperial criticism was only a passing fad of no particular importance in itself. He comes to this judgment as a result of extrapolating this philosophical movement from the cultural impulses of that, of that particular period. <clears throat> but Machism and the anti-realist challenge of materialism would not go away. It gained new ground with the triumph of the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum physics, an interpretation that denied objective reality and claimed that scientific truth cannot be disentangled from the observer. By the 1920s, uh, Machism also gained a new lease on life with the development of the Vienna Circle School of Logical Positivism. The positivism of the Vienna Circle had a symbiotic relationship with the anti-realist interpretation of physics developed by Niels Bohr and Werner Heisenberg. It did not go unchallenged, most notably by Einstein. And in the 1950s, a dialectical materialist interpretation of quantum physics was offered by David Bohm, who was working within the legacy begun by Lenin. Anti-realism today has a huge foothold among natural sciences, even though the specific school of logical positivism is no longer influential. It has been said that positive, positivism is the largely unconscious but default reaction of scientists who are not engaged with philosophy and only a tiny minority of scientists are engaged with philosophy. So anti Anti-realist theories continue to flourish, largely unchallenged. Among these are the cosmological theories of a multiverse. What it means is that subjective idealism, anti-realism, is not simply a passing fad, but a devil that never dies. In this area, Lenin proved to be more far-seeing than Horkheimer. And that's as far as I've gotten. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. And finally, we have uh, Tom Cannell. Tom, you might want to unmute yourself. 
sorry about that. Um, I just said, uh, I just thanked Divya and I thanked everybody who uh, worked on putting um, this together and expressed my delight at being here. I understand that Platypus Chief Pedagogue Chris Coutrone actually helped uncover the 1956 conversations of Fia Adorno and Max Horkheimer, which are our focus today. My goal will be to examine how Adorno and Horkheimer see here their own relation to Marxist politics. I'll define Marxist politics as politics oriented to establishing a dictatorship of the proletariat that will supposedly lead to communism. To be clear, I am not advocating Marxist politics here. Though not relevant to our topic, I don't consider myself a Marxist since I don't think that the dictatorship of the proletariat is a coherent notion or that attempts to realize it are going to end well. The prevalence of non-revolutionary leadership in the workers' movement and the failure of national sections of the Second International to block their respective nations' participation in World War I propelled Lenin and others to see the revolutionary party as essential for Marxist politics. Opposing the idea that a party representing the entire working class could enable the dictatorship of the proletariat, Lenin and his co-thinkers argued for a disciplined party of the revolutionary vanguard which initially at least would not contain the entire working class, but just its most ideologically developed elements, as well as professional revolutionaries. Of course, ideologically developed proletarians might become professional revolutionaries over time. The containment of the Russian 1917 revolution and the alleged failure of ostensibly revolutionary parties to sustain themselves as <coughs> genuinely revolutionary parties thereafter led to the need Adorno and Horkheimer felt for critical theory. Critical theory is how, even before the 1950s, they had come to label um, their project. In some ways, critical theory was just a euphemism for Marxism, which was not respectable during the Cold War, especially in 1950s West Germany. It can also be understood as what Marxist intellectuals do when a Marxist politics seem impossible. In the conversations referred to, Adorno and Horkheimer identified the impossibility of Marxist politics with the absence of the party. Adorno and Horkheimer make it clear, I think, that they mean the party of the kind Lenin had advocated. Since, according to Adorno and Horkheimer, there can't be Marxist politics if there is no party. A different term than Marxism was required to describe their project in the absence of the party. And critical theory served this function well. How did Marx and Lenin then make critical theory possible and allegedly necessary? Ironically, by articulating the need for the proletariat to cons constitute itself as a party and then having history fail to meet that need. Adorno, Horkheimer et al. argue that capitalist domination over the working class has become more extensive and total than Marx had imagined. Thus, the challenge of replacing working class interest group politics with proletarian revolutionary politics based on the party has become overwhelming. Working class organizations such as unions, like the one I work for, are dismissed by Adorno and Horkheimer as mere rackets. But it gets worse. Adorno and Horkheimer believe that domination is so general and total, constraining people's very capacity for independent thought, that even alleged revolutionary organizations are incapable of becoming re genuine revolutionary parties. Instead, they themselves become rackets promoting what critical theorists view as empty pseudo activism. Critical theorists damning evaluation of the left ensures that the left will generally find critical theory either irrelevant or dangerous. Horkheimer identifies two elephants in the room, so to speak, confronting critical theory. He says, quote, 
the entire rationale for theory seems to have disappeared because on the one hand, the bourgeoisie transforms thought into fact, and on the other, the party no longer exists. The elephants are related. For critical theory, a conceptually rigid stating of facts representable through formal logic cannot deal with a contradictory reality in perpetual flux. Rigid thinking of this kind is, according to Adorno and Horkheimer, a real obstacle to the emergence of the party. Rigorous intellectual skepticism and perpetual conceptual self-questioning, i.e. dialectics, are required to rebuild Marxism and the party, at least according to Adorno and Horkheimer, and I think Lukács would agree. But once a party is formed, how would intellectuals currently labeled critical theorists fit in? In a different context, specifically that of a 1939-1940 faction fight in the American Socialist Workers Party, Amer um, Tr Trotsky reacting to Dwight MacDonald declared, quote, he who propagates theoretical skepticism is a traitor, unquote. Critical theorists are, by definition, I think, all about theoretical skepticism. Would Trotsky label them all traitors? Trotsky particularly resented any questioning of the tenets of dialectical materialism. Trotsky's materialist dialectics, however, involve a robust rejection of theoretical skepticism and are therefore in a profoundly different register from the materialist dialectics of critical theory. In conclusion, if I've got time, um, I will indulge myself by considering how my own political background drew me to or repelled me from engagement with critical theory. As an acolyte of democratic socialist Michael Harrington, I inherited some Schachmanite prejudices. Max Schachman was a key leader of the faction uh, that opposed Trotsky in the aforementioned faction fight. Schachmann denied the political salience of dialectics. This did not encourage en engagement with critical theory on my part. Moreover, Michael Fa Harrington taught me the political importance of engaging with the very unions and social movements that Adorno and Horkheimer considered mere rackets. Um, Adorno and Horkheimer and critical theory also jived badly with the, res with the reflexive support of strikes and industrial action, et cetera, that I learned at Marxist knees um, as a schoolboy Labour Party young socialist during the 1970s in England. So I admit ongoing resistance on my part. My heyday, such as it was as an American socialist, dated roughly from 1979 to 1988 or so. That made me part of what Platypus refers to as the post-political left. I think it, of it more as the left that grew of age in the context of a theoretical crisis of Marxism as well as of a social democratic politics based on the so-called labor metaphysic. For us, this was a crisis of unorthodox Marxism as much as orthodox Marxism. If DSA youth section members from the 80s engaged with philosophical theory, it was more likely to be the post-Marxism of Laclau and Mouffe, for example, than the persistent Marxism of Adorno and Horkheimer. Despite a long time fascination with philosophy, um, it, it took going to a platypus reading group to get me to truly engage with critical theory. That was the, one of the many benefits I got from attending the reading group. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. And thank you to all our panelists for your opening remarks. Um, we will now move on to uh, responses, which are intended to be quick two to three minute responses to each other. So anything that struck you about each other's remarks. Um, and, you know, just to kind of refresh and very quickly remind um, some points that came up. Um, Paul, uh, Paul D. 
um, in your remarks, you uh, mentioned how Adorno's uh, confession of his Leninism does not necessarily amount to Leninism. Um, and um, hence calling into question the kind of um, what we take for granted or what we posit in the prompt as Adorno's Leninism. Um, and you know, this is related to a guiding question that I just want to pose to all of you, which is the Frankfurt School's relationship to the possibility of um, a political party, right? Or the relationship between the Frankfurt School and the political party. So, um, because I think that's implicit um, in uh, Paul, Paul DeMarty, your um, comment there. Um, Paul Brynes, um, you had a different tack on your critique of the prompt. Um, and you mentioned how the Frankfurt School is not Leninist. So the, you know, what we cite about Adorno and Horkheimer and what they, what they say, what they admit or confess um, as um, not really um, positing a connection between the Frankfurt School or critical theory and its Leninism. And again, I wanted to pose the question of the political party form of, of politics um, and the relationship between critical theory and that. Um, with um, Alex, I, you know, you talked about Adorno and Lenin in terms of mass psychology. And I wanted to ask you if you might also approach that um, more explicitly in terms of a mass politics or you know, if you could give a political um, direction to that particular observation. Um, and this party question that, you know, I, I know you have a background in, in um, the Trotskyist politics as well. So I would sort of just ask you if you'd like to speak to that. Um, and Tom, um, again, you know, you mentioned the absence of the party and the impossibility of politics that, um, Adorno and Horkheimer recognize um, because of the absence of the political party and um, how you might relate that um, or just, you know, um, maybe say a little more about it, but you don't have to respond to this, what, you know, how I summed up your remarks, but it could be anything of interest that um, struck you while your fellow panelists were speaking. So let's begin with Paul Damati. So I'm sorry, it's the classic running joke of like Zoom meetings of which some people not confuse themselves. But um, yes, I thought I found um, all the openings very interesting. Um, I think yes, the the party the party question I think is probably worth pressing to a point. Um, uh, so I mean, so um, in terms of the relationship between uh, sort of the Frankfurt School and the party, I think it's kind of it's worth mentioning. I think a bit. You know, the, Commun the Communist Party of Germany still existed when this exchange took place. It was banned about six months later. So maybe joining it would have been a bad idea. But um, it's worth knowing that when they say there is no party, it does seem to me that they're doing something like New Cash does in, um, in sort of the, the that chapter of history in class consciousness, where he sort of poses it as a kind of theoretical ideal type. And I think that is um, a problematic way to pose the question and it's very different to the way, for example, Marx and Engels talk about um, their work um, in the Communist Manifesto, but elsewhere. Um, just, yeah, on terms of, um, I, it's a good point in terms of the Ligstein quote that Paul mentioned that um, a lot of, uh, lot of our kind of breakthroughs in theory are the kind of result of defeat, uh, result of defeat. And actually you said starting with 1847, 1848, I think, um, talking about Schaffenites, I think uh, Dra Hell Draper's book, Karl Marx's Theory of Evolution, essentially starts with the argument, well, we have anything resembling Marxism because when Marx and Engels were liberals in the 1842-1843, they were defeated in Prussia. Um, the liberal movement was, uh, was uh, failed to, to, over to go beyond um, um, its immediate kind of uh, demands to true freedom. 
um, just like um, I think what else is worth mentioning. I found I found um, Alice's presentation very interesting, but because I'm so unfamiliar with the source material, I feel completely unable to comment on it. Um, but uh, it's just in terms of the detail, you know, the part, the, the question that Tom raised. I think that I just want to push back a little bit again. It's on the party question, like. It, it is not the, it, the, the idea of the Leninist party as a kind of, as sort of a big idea of Lenin's that is a massive break in the Second International is, has come under, to my estimation, completely total destruction under the weight of revisionist historical scholarship since the end of the Cold War. I mean, particularly people like Lars Lee have addressed that many of the things that in the starting in the mid 20s really onwards have been projected back onto Lenin as a kind of massive break for the second international actually Lenin was an ordinary second international Marxist working in a very very weird country um, and uh, which would have particular demand, uh, sort of demands on his time so in a certain sense like the you can certainly look at the uh, Bolshevik revolution as a failure I mean I don't I, I think if you look at the first few years obviously it turns into a military dictatorship but it is a failure of the traditional Marxist left and the um, the kind of theorizations of Bolshe sort of the Bolshevik party actually post state that as justifications for militarization. So um, I'm trying to think, yeah, Trotsky or McDonald, I think I agree that his Trotsky's writings on philosophy in the 30s are very poor compared to when he was writing about psychoanalysis or um, um, writing about uh, culture and art in the 20s, he's much more subtle thinker than um, he uh, allowed himself to be at that time. I think I'll leave it there to avoid taking up too much time. Paul Brynas, you have a couple of minutes to respond. Yeah, I just want to un unmute. Um, I, I, I'm hesitating to speak because I'm, I'm, I've really been blown away by, by my three fellow panelists. I just think you guys presented such interesting, fascinating things. And I hope the things you've, your remarks will be available in print in some form or another, even in manuscript, because I'd love to read them and look at them more closely. Um, it's, uh, I learned a lot and realized that uh, my move away from all of this kind of thinking and discussion and being involved in very other kinds of po politics um, uh, makes me a little bit want to go back. I want to throw in just as a, 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 a since we're focusing on the party, somehow that has emerged uh, as as a question and something that even uh, uh, Adorno and Horkheimer were were concerned with. To throw in a, a, a quotation from Marx dating back to which Paul DeMarty mentioned from Draper's book when Marx was emerging from his liberalism in his uh, graduate student days, and and this is from 1843 in. Uh, his uh, critique of Hegel's philosophy of right, uh, to shift the question of the party or to connect the question of the party to the, the, the related question of theory and its relationship to the proletariat or the masses or to the issues of mass psychology that Alex so perceptively um, put on the table for us. The weapon of criticism cannot, of course, replace criticism by weapons. This is Marx using the chiasmus form <laughs> that was characteristic of the left Hegelians. It's wonderful. Criticism cannot, of course, replace criticism by weapon. The weapon of criticism can't replace criticism by weapons. Material force must be overthrown by material force. But theory also becomes a material force as soon as it has gripped the masses. Theory is capable of gripping the masses as soon as it demonstrates ad hominem. And it demonstrates ad hominem as soon as it becomes radical. One could say that we can see Marx with a limited notion of mass psychology uh, at, at that point. But the notion of theory becomes a material force as soon as it grips the masses. Isn't that the dream uh, that has motivated so much, and it's the shattering of that dream of, of theory gripping the masses um, that in, in certain ways we're, we're talking about. Um, so I, I uh, put that out there. And again, 
applaud my my fellow uh, panelists for really fascinating stuff. Thank you, Paul. And um, Alex, did you want to respond? Uh, <clears throat> uh, okay, well, I, I, I feel obligated <clears throat> to respond to the uh, uh, to Paul's uh, remarks about Trotsky's writings in the 1930s not being very subtle. <laughs> I, I, I think you will find that uh, the most incisive critique of fascism of the of the uh, of the disastrous policy of the Popular Front that was dominated the common turn uh, and, and of the earlier policy of, uh, um, of the, the ultra left policy of uh, denouncing the social democrats, the social fascists, all that. I mean, Trotsky has a lot to tell us and his writings in the 1930s were among his best in my opinion. Uh, but getting back to the topic at hand, um, the political dimension of uh, Lenin and uh, the Frankfurt School, I don't think there's any there there, frankly, not much. I mean, yes, there was a certain, it's in, it is interesting that Adorno and Horkheimer were, have had some conversations about this and they had, they had a certain notion that uh, socialism will come about through a revolution led by a party, but that's a, I don't really see much more than that. So I don't, I don't find that discussion interesting in the slightest. I think much more interesting is the their intersection on the question of psychology and of culture. These and these were issues that Marx, of course, only you know had a glimmer of. He, I mean, he did. He certainly recognized it, but the actual investigation of mass psychology of um, of, of of the effect that an alienated existence has on our culture and our, and our ability to even think properly, that, that all happens much later. And some of the pioneers in that effort, despite their political differences, were, were people who came from the uh, critical theory, were the left Freudians and so on. And that's, and, and that, that's, the, that's the importance they have for those of us who have not given up on the project of Marx and of socialism. Thank you, Alex. Uh, unless you have anything to add, let's move on to Tom Cannell for responses. Oh, um, you should probably unmute, Tom. I thought I did. Um, uh, with, res uh, with respect to Trotsky in the 1930s, I think what one can say is that the interventions of the philosophical nature in the 39 to 1940 faction fight um, um, in the American Socialist Workers Party that Trotsky engaged in were crude and bad. Um, there is other writings about dialectics that I actually haven't read, but I have been told about that Trotsky did during the 30s um, that weren't published publicly and weren't part of an inter-party, uh, inner-party faction fight, but are actually very rich um, and interesting. So I think that the critique that I would want to make is about very specifically like the open letter to Burnham and his article on the petty bourgeois opposition um, in, um, in, the, in the Socialist Workers' Party and that kind of stuff. Um, I think that um, to Paul D's point, um, I've read with fascination Lars Lee's um, 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 rereading of, of what is to be done. And it sounds very convincing to me. Um, and it's not the, it's, um, it may very well be true. It's not the understanding of Leninist history that, that I was brought up with. Um, and I think that that um, in, in terms of interpreting what Horkheimer and Adorno mean, um, they were, I think, operating much more under the under under that old interpretation. 
Um, so, so, so that old interpretation might be, even if it's inaccurate, might be best for interpreting what Adorno and Horkheimer actually mean. Um, and um, I think that, now who knows whether Adorno and Horkheimer, what was actually in the, in the deep crevices of their hearts and whether they were basically just posturing um, when, they, when they said that, that they were Leninists or not. Um, I think it's interesting as a intellectual exercise and edifying as an intellectual exercise to actually try and take them at their word and actually see where that takes you and whether that leads to a, to a, um, um, to a viable, to, to an interesting or viable position to analyze. And I think that in terms of what they actually say, whether they mean it or not, they do say in these conversations that Mark Horkheimer says that they have nothing else um, but the tradition of, of Marx and Lenin um, to fall back on. And, um, and Horkheimer says the absence of a party is a real, real problem. And, um, and Adorno does sort of explicitly, as well as saying um, um, it's a problem that there's no party, say he wants to revive the tradition of Marx and Lenin. Um, so, so I think it's interesting to just sort of like take, take them at their word and see that if we, if we do assume that they are, they are sincere, do they have something interesting to say? Thank you. Thanks, Tom, and thanks to all our panelists. Um, we're going to open up, open it up for audience Q and A. And so, I just want to ask everyone in the audience to use the um, raise hand button, or the which is probably under reactions, if you want to ask your question out loud, which is probably preferable. Um, and if not, you can type your question in the chat box. And uh, panelists, please don't. Um, you know, it, you need not respond to the chat stream. I will filter the questions for you and then we can respond and, and then um, you can respond that way. We have a question from Kevin, whom I will turn to now. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, first of all, thanks to all the panelists for the very interesting presentation. So it was very informative. Uh, so Tom can now already address this. So this is addressed to both Pauls and Alex. So what do you guys see as the relationship behind your guys' political commitments to the politics of critical theory, right? Because at face value, they're very different. I know Paul DeMarty, you're part of the CPGB, which is this sort of, you know, clearinghouse refuge from the rest of the left. In Great Britain that has, you know, neo kautskyanism people who have come from Stalinist and Trotskyist groups who have ended up there. And Paul Brynus, you were active in the civil rights movement as a freedom writer. And Alex, uh, you were uh, in the Workers League. You believed in revolutionary Trotskyism. Uh, this was in the, I think, you know, and so what do you guys see as your political commitments there? What do you see as the relationship to the politics of critical theory in, for instance, Adorno, Horkheimer at Frankfurt School? Sorry, if everyone else is silent, I suppose that's a good question. Um, yeah, so I mean, yes, yeah, for people who are not that familiar with the CPT group, I mean, we are a sense, you know, in form, we are a kind of traditional, small, far left Marxist propaganda group. Um, uh, so, um, for, for my particular background, it's simply that um, I became a sort of conscious Marxist um, at the same time that I accidentally read a book by Slavoj Zizek and decided that philosophy was really, really interesting and I wanted to sort of like just do nothing but read philosophy all the time. Um, so in practice, um, I've always, the, the critical theory school has always been partly, um, it's always been something I've been kind of at a certain distance from because for a long time essentially I was um, an Althusserian Marxist, sort of very old fashioned dogmatic Althusserian. Um, but I always found the, um, the work of the, of the Frankfurt School writers 
um, enjoyable essentially as literature that it was very, very, ple it was pleasurable to read for somebody um, like me who didn't feel much connection to existing mass culture and um, um, and sort of like the uh, the kind of grand ambitions of, of the whole thing. I think in the sense like for how the, the, the organizational culture the CPGB tries to build is based on sharp criticism, um, is kind of the sort of uh, sort of thing I think Tom was mentioning in his opening um, that uh, that you would need that that you would need a, a sort of uh, very much a sort of safe safety to criticize the existing line, criticize the leadership, oppose the standard, opposing the leadership, and so on, which is unfortunately completely lacking certainly on the British sort of far left in terms of like groups like ours. Um, but also we this is slightly complicated in the sense that we are we actively refuse to base ourselves on theoretical ideas we're not like a lot of Trotskyist groups who are based on say the theory of permanent revolution and so on so um the more in a weird way the kind of more critical skeptical forms of philosophical writing actually fit better um I guess with our culture in some ways I, I don't think it's a huge like I don't I think I'm probably the only one who uh, eats a huge amount of stuff um, just quickly on Trotsky, just to say, when I was saying he was vulgar in the 30s, I meant specifically the text Tom mentioned, I think his writings on fascism are absolutely, you know, without parallel in terms of the period, the best, best writings, for example. So I think a lot of his political writings are very good. I don't think his philosophical writings in terms of the ones I've read are great, ex great uh, explorations of those particular ideas compared to what he was writing in the 20s on literature, art, thoroughly. Does anyone else want to respond to Kevin's question? Uh, yeah, I want to respond uh, both to Kevin's question and a little bit beyond. Um, first, I, uh, I think if uh, you're going to discuss this relationship of uh, critical theory to Leninism, you have to get some understanding of what Leninism is. And I think there's been some huge, historically, some huge misunderstandings about it. Uh, I am not uh, a follower of Lars Lee in this respect. I, I do think Lenin did represent a fundamental break with the Second International, uh, not, not completely and not right away, but uh, by 1914, he was well on, he was well on his way. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't agree with that, but I, I do think since it was mentioned, uh, somebody who did uh, provide some insight into Lenin uh, was Hal Draper who wrote wrote a couple of very interesting uh, pieces back in the 70s about what the uh, Lenin and the Bolshevik party were about. And it was not this authoritarian centralized structure that the opponents of Lenin and Leninism make, make, make it out to be. But anyway, I, I don't wanna dwell too much on that. I, just getting back to this, uh, this question of the politics, uh, I'll reiterate, I don't think there's I don't think there's much commonality in politics here. I mean, if, if I were to uh, discuss strictly political issues about the Frankfurt School, I would say uh, they were really quite cowardly in, in their failure to uh, denounce the Moscow trials, for instance. They could have done it. There was nothing stopping them, but they, they remained silent. Why? Obviously, they did not want to break all ties with uh, members of the Communist Party, I suppose. Uh, it, one can speculate. Uh, um, I think. The, I think of of all the uh, the members of the Frankfurt Institute, the the ones who I, I would say deserve some respect for their political stand, even if I, I didn't totally agree with it. Were were would would have been Eric Fromm and Herbert Marcuse. Uh, while I I I I did not follow Marcuse and his pessimistic uh, rejection of the working class as having any relevance in, uh, uh, in post-capitalist society, uh, one has to say that he was always looking for, for some way to transcend existing capitalism. He was always looking for some revolutionary force somewhere, uh, whether it's students or uh, alienated minorities or whatever. I mean, I, I think he was wrong to look there, but I 
I give him credit for looking at least, which is more than some people did. And uh, Eric Fromm developed a, a very interesting understanding of Mar Marxist humanism, which I think is still valid. Um, and uh, and I and, and I think there are there are a lot of insights uh, in terms of uh, consumer society and the uh, the ideological problems uh, that we have today. Uh, problems that other other authors, such as a more contemporary author like Thomas Frank, have tried to address. Why is it that workers continually are uh, acting and voting against their class interests. These, these are questions that uh, people like Adorno and Horkheimer uh, explored. And I think that I think that was a very valid, valid work in that area. Thank you, Alex and Paul. Brynus, were you trying to jump in? Yes, I, 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 thank you. And um, Alex, I, I, I present myself now as a case study in, in what you were just talking about. Uh, autobiographically. Um, yeah, I participated in 1961 in the Freedom Rise to Jackson, Mississippi, um, and then returned to the University of Wisconsin in the early 60s, 62, 63, became involved in the Socialist Club, uh, got attracted to Marxism, spent about a year being a Stalinist, uh, and then moved away into a kind of anarcho this and that. But the crucial thing that happened was in 1964, I read Marcuse's One Dimensional Man. And when it came to the conclusions, which Alex critically referred to of Marcuse's sense that capitalism had succeeded in incorporating the working class as a negative force into its um, gigantic digestive system, uh, but that there was still hope as, as Alex was suggesting, uh, there was still hope. And that hope, and he quoted Walter Benjamin at the very end, uh, that hope, uh, it is only for the sake of those without hope that hope is given to us. And he refers to marginalized groups, to racial minorities, to students. And when I read that in 1964, it changed my life. That is, it suddenly, I suddenly thought, ah, I'm a student. I've been involved in anti-racism and the beginnings of the anti-Vietnam war, war, movement, war movement, but I don't have a large perspective. And Marcuse, I mean, that was the delusion that seduced me, I mean, to sort of look at it from perhaps from Alex's standpoint. And I got involved in the Frankfurt School and because uh, Marcuse dedicates the book to Max Horkheimer and the Institute for Social Research, that led me to Horkheimer's Eclipse of Reason and then in Madison, as a graduate student, along with Russell Jacoby and Stuart Ewan, we formed a group called the Ad Hoc Committee for Thinking, following the Frankfurt School idea of the importance of thinking. And of course, the acronym for the Ad Hoc Committee for Thinking is ACT. And what we did was we had a mimeograph machine and we passed out leaflets. Some of the leaflets just suggested that people could read One Dimensional Man or Eros and Civilization by Marcuse. Uh, and others began to develop little critiques of the world. We just started putting out aphorisms in the Horkheimer spirit and began circulating stuff. And we finally became so popular that we had to get two more mimeograph machines and people did their own little act tracts, as we called them. And then they wanted us to form an organization. And we held a mass meeting to which about 300 students came in 1963. And we said that we were disbanding because our perspective was anti-organizational and we rejected not only parties, but we rejected all organization. We were that sophomoric, even as uh, we were past the sophomore year. Um, and then I became involved with Telos Magazine and was sort of immersed at, in critical theory and put together the book on uh, of essays on Marcuse in 1970 that Tom Cannell um, uh, kindly uh, referred to when we were talking in the beginning. And then what happened was that um, Telos moved rapidly to the right. I felt happily alone again. And um, I then entered into uh, intimate relations with men kind of late in my life. 
and realized that I was what, what is called in our funny sexual system, a bisexual. And I became fascinated as Marcuse was in Eros, the civilization, where Marcuse does mention in that book from 1955, he suggests uh, an affinity between the homosexual and the critical theorist, that these are both figures who look at the dominant system from a margin. And it's not surprising that a lot of Marcuse's, that Marcuse's Eros Civilization, before Foucault appeared on the scene, Eros the Civilization was the beginnings of gay liberation theory. I mention this because part of my move away from Marxism was a move into a very different perspective. I became, as I had by Marcuse originally, I became in a very different way captivated by the way in which gay men and lesbians looked at the world that I lived in and looked at the world that I was part of and where I was making assumptions about sex and sexuality that I had no idea I even had. And I began to learn about homophobia as a cultural system. And I decided that if critical theory were gonna be of any help, I didn't wanna to come to this new world and impose critical theory on it. I had to have faith in critical theory that it would be with me every time I found something new. Uh, uh, and, and so I, I, uh, then what happened was gay marriage and society in America began to kind of say, we're here, we're queer, and we're used to it. And the cutting edge I learned in my teaching of the gay perspective, if there is such a thing, began to dull. And what happened by coincidence was that uh, it was the, the uh, 50th anniversary in, I guess, 2011 of the Freedom Rides of 1961. And, um, then, and Obama had been elected and there was a kind of renaissance of interest in the Freedom Rides. And to my shock, and uh, there was a developing interest in having people who had been Freedom Riders and had been in prison uh, for some time in, uh, in Jackson, Mississippi and Parchman, Mississippi, uh, should speak about their experiences. And I became involved in speaking about civil rights and got involved in, in, all, in a lot of the efforts today, it's sort of combating white supremacy in America and worldwide. And so I, I, there's a lot of critical theory that stays with me, but um, I found that a lot of the concerns, in fact, some of the topics that you guys have discussed so brilliantly, the Trotsky debates and, and so forth, and, and, and the imperial criticism, materialism, imperial, imperial criticism debates, um, which are fascinating, just no longer spoke to the things that really were, were sort of in, uh, in my heart. But uh, I have to say that this conversation, which is, I, I'm very surprised to be saying this, um, that you three co-panelists really kind of touched my, the Marxist part of my heart that I had kind of uh, put aside. So thank you very much. I'm sorry to go on for so long, but I think that's really what I wanted to say. Thank you, Paul. Um, and uh, Tom, did you have a response to Kevin's question? Or can I take a question from the chat box? And then maybe we can, yeah, OK. Um, I'm going to take a question from the chat box. It's related to um, Alex, what you were saying, um, your sort of critique of the Frankfurt School, even though it was the Frankfurt School's relationship to the Communist Party. Um, and also, Paul, um, some of what you were just um, laying out. Um, it's from Anna, and Anna asks, during the Frankfurt School's time in New York City, Paul Keimer insisted that they not engage with politics. He feared they would lose funding from Columbia. They were forced to adopt an apolitical position and remain sequestered on the Upper West Side. Don't you find it a loss that they never engaged with the downtown leftist movements, including thinkers like Irving Howe, et cetera? So whoever wants to respond. Um... Uh, <clears throat> I'll respond. Uh, well, um, again, I'm, uh, I think 
I think people are looking for something that really isn't there. I, I would not look to the Frankfurt School for political guidance. Uh, I think their <clears throat> their main value was in the in the in the area of of a theory of mass psychology of 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 a, of a critique of, of culture. Um, uh, should the should should they have uh, felt free to discuss their politics? Of course, but uh, they obviously felt they were under certain constraints when they were in the United States and. Um, I mean, the same thing happened to other groups of refugees from Nazi Germany, for instance, the Bauhaus movement, which was very, very political when they were in Germany and became completely apolitical once they came to the United States. So the, the, these were tragic circumstances that, uh, uh, but, uh, but if you're asking me if I, if I thought there was going to be some, uh, some important guidance from uh, Adorno and Horkheimer to, to those who were interested in, in building a socialist movement in the United States. I don't really see that, sorry. <laughs> not, not in an overt political sense anyway. That's that's a really interesting question, and and and, and Alex, I I don't I, I I think I agree with most of what you uh, you just said, but I wondered the following, and I'm trying to find uh, an unsnarky way of of expressing this. Um, the, uh, the 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 person who asked the question points to the the Frankfurt School and Horkheimer at Col on Morningside Drive. Uh, very explicitly saying we, we, we don't talk about politics. We have to, in effect, we have to hide our politics. That was not only the same thing that was faced by say the, the Bauhaus school, that was, that was characteristic of, of much of the, Ameri of the American communist movement in the, at, at that time, that is. And so one has to, I think, ask the question, and this is what I mean by less, finding, in any case, the question of, would you want to say that Horkheimer's tactic in that moment uh, was part and parcel of what is being called his Leninism? Isn't that the way Leninists behaved at that time in the United States, the, the Communist Party of the USA? Or any sort of, you know, no, we we we're we're not communists. We don't belong to the Communist Party. Half the people I met on the left in Madison, Wisconsin, when I was a freshman in 1959 and began my brief career as a Stalinist, didn't tell me or anybody else that they were members of the Communist Party. They just belonged to the Socialist Club. I found out that they were Leninists decades later when they, they told me with some in, you know, bemused, oh yeah, I was in the Communist Youth League. That the way the way Horkheimer was suggesting the Frankfurt School behaved was characteristic of late 19 of Cold War Leninism in the United States. No, I think it was just characteristic of people who were trying to be careful. <laughs> uh, some simply, you know, I mean, it would, um, I don't see it as particularly characteristic of Leninism. It was characteristic of any immigrant group that felt threatened if. Uh, their their political viewpoints were going to be challenging to the current uh, to the current authority uh, under whose watch they were allowed to live. Okay. Uh, so I mean, they, you know, they, there were certain dependents. You know, don't forget they were refugees uh, from uh, Nazi Germany. They they uh, they were fully dependent on uh, whatever funding they had. Uh, they they didn't have. Any, anything of their own to fall back on. So they were being super careful. I don't blame them for that. Uh, whether, whether they could have been more sophisticated or more subterranean in expressing their politics, maybe. But again, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't see that uh, their politics, they're, they're interacting with the political community in uh, New York City in the, in the 1940s would have would, would have made a huge difference as to the direction of that political community. Let's put it that way. Let me, um, let me just uh, ask if 
Paul, yeah, Paul DeMonte, would you like to enter this conversation? Just quickly, I mean, I think it's sort of worth stressing that, you know, that there will have been people who were emigres fleeing the Nazis, fleeing the events of the, of the Second World War and what have you, who arrived in New York and did get involved in left-wing politics. But it took a, a, a lot of courage, obviously, but then also probably a certain amount of know-how. I think in a weird way, if uh, if, if Korkheimer had been a Leninist in the sense of he was a hardened cader <laughs> with years of experience in the sort of German communist movement, he might like he might have had, well, okay, we all adopt fake names. Um, you know, then we're going to have plausible deniability, secret print shop, all that kind of stuff. That's what people do do often. Um, but uh, it requires an awful lot and it sort of it requires having been active, I think. In a, in a movement that's had those problems already, weirdly. And I think it's what it tells you is that by that point, by the time they were in textile, they were quite academicized even at that point. Um, so I think that's a sort of worth, worth bearing in mind. Of course, it's nice, it'd be interesting to speculate on, you know, on sort of Lenin at the Cabaret Voltaire type scenarios with all these people in New York. But um, uh, yeah, I think that fundamentally the fact that their project was not directly political in Germany Part must partly explain why uh, Horkheimer was so concerned to keep um, keep things on an even keel in New York. Just quickly, Paul, I just want to put a finer point on this relationship of theory and politics. When you were talking about the CPGB, you talked about how your politics is not founded upon theory, but then you are Marxists, and so um, you know. The, the Marxist project is founded upon a critique, a theory um, mm. of um, the crisis mm. of bourgeois society and capitalism. So um, can you speak a little bit more yeah. about? I, I think what, what I would, um, what I say, so what we all found, we have a program, which is a list, a list of, you know, political demands and a, dis, and a hopeful starry-eyed description of the communist future. Um, and if you're a member, you are required to accept that program as a basis for ongoing political work. Not agree, you're not required to agree with everything in it, because peculiarly, you could almost disagree with everything, but just go along with it. But that would be obviously very weird. But what we don't ask is for people to set like often groups groups have split on, for example whether capitalist crisis is explained by the tendency of the rate of profit to fall or whether it's explained by disproportionality or underconsumption or so on. Like we have no such, like you can have any theory of crisis you like in the CPGB. That's not, we, we think it's harmful in these two splits if you start um, making an agreement with theoretical propositions, a condition of membership. And that's a serious defect of um, actually existing left organisations. So yes, I mean, of course, like we are all Marxists. We've all read plenty of Marx and Lenin and, uh, you know, whatever else. Um, and in that sense, the, the, the group is founded on Marxist theory, but it is, not, it, is, it is not founded on the agreement with, say, this or that thesis. If you think about like how Lukács describes orthodox Marxism, actually, it's almost not a terrible model. Um, for, for what I'm trying to say there. Thank you. Um, we have a question that actually will help us continue this conversation. Um, and I do want to see if Tom wants to take the first stab at it. Um, it is actually, it's a question from Dane who asks, and this is again related to what we were just talking about, um, which is about relating um, to the politics of critical theory, how do the panelists understand the difference between Adorno's and Marcuse's politics? So Tom, if you would like to take that or we can open it up to any panelist who wants to respond first, but I wanna to give Tom the first opportunity. Here we go. Um, I think that, um, the difference between Adorno and Marcuse is primarily um, a question of melancholy and that that Adorno is very melancholic about politics and Marcuse isn't. 
So they're both they're both very pessimistic about the industrial working class um, playing a revolutionary role, um, and that produces for Adorno a sort of feeling of melancholic, um, uh, yeah, mel mel melancholic defeat, and and Mercuser is looking for sort of um, subversive, uh, transgressive, liberationist um, movements and possibilities uh, wherever, wherever he could. So, um, so that I think is the, 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 the big difference. Could I just say something quickly about, um, about Adorno and Horkheimer's avoidance of politics? Um, sure. because, um, because I think there may have been more to it than just self-preservation um, and um, trying to sort of um, avoid McCarthyism and so forth and so on. Um, I think that in Adorno's case in particular, there was a real critique and um, disdain for political activism as it was as it was occurring at, at his time. Um, I think that there's a real sense in which he saw it as being um, a racket and, um, and, um, and, and the activism as he was necessarily pseudo activism. I mean, ironically, I think there's a certain similarity between Adorno's criticisms of, um, of the, um, of, of left activism in his time and the CPGB's criticisms of a certain um, Leninist organization that shall be unnamed um, in Britain um, in terms of in terms of their in, in terms of their um, alleged pseudo activism. So I mean so so I think with, with Adorno there, there's that difference. With Horkheimer, I think that's the Cold War. Um, I think that, you know, that, that, that there, there's this interesting, there's this interesting section in the conversations um, that we alluded to, that alluded to in the prompt, where Horkheimer says the best available system, possible system, is probably the American system. And in the brilliant collection that Paul Reines edited. There's an article by is it by, Paul is it by William Lease? Did, did I get it? Um, um, there's a there's a there's an uh, article um, which quotes Horkheimer as saying as being very defensive of the free world um, and of the of the need not to basically undermine the free world the, the the free world um, as it is under under danger um, and the and the implication is from among other things, Stalinism as a global social system. Um, and I, I think that, that impacted Horkheimer's reluctance to engage with, um, with the left. Um, now, does, is that, does that mean that he can't possibly have been a Leninist? Well, I'm reminded of like, um, um, People who met me in, in, in DSOC um, and DSA told me stories of the old Socialist Party, where there were these Shachmanites who would, in one sentence, um, say that they were absolutely orthodox Leninists, and in the next um, sentence, say they supported the American war in Vietnam. Um, and, um, and so there were people who basically had in that, who thought they could somehow hold on to Leninism, but that required different political positions in the context of a global totalitarian, however you want to define it in terms of what kind of state you want to call it, um, threat. And I think that impacted Holkheimer. There's a, um, I agree. There's a, a very, very interesting book by uh, a historian now retired from Brown named uh, Mary Jo Buell, B-U-H-L-E, called, uh, I think it's called 
psychoanalysis and its discontents. And it's a study of the relationship between psychoanalysis and feminism. And in her book, she has a chapter um, on, this gets to the question of the difference between Mar differences between Marcuse and Adorno. Um, Buell has a very interesting chapter on the way in which uh, psych the psychoanalysis and feminism dynamic plays out in the new left. And part of what she shows in the course of this chapter is the difference, the, the deep difference in the way in which Marcuse in Eros and Civilization in 1955 and Adorno in various of his writings treat the, the figure of Narcissus and that Marcuse's discussion of narcissism is very, very affirmative and positive. Not that he endorses narcissism, but he endorses very deeply what Freud calls primary narcissism, which becomes part of a mature ego in which, but it's very important that narcissism be part of that developed ego, Marcuse insists, whereas Adorno's view of narcissus, narcissus is, is quite negative by comparison. And what she then shows or suggests is that out of that division, there arises even within the journal Telos among American younger critical theory types like myself, um, a division between those who are moving in the direction of a kind of Frankfurt School inspired conservative cultural politics, not being positive about homosexuality, not being generally misogynist and the like, whereas Marcuse's, the, the other side, and which comes out of Marcuse's treatment of Narcissus in Eros and Civilization, is much more a kind of 1960s sex radicalism and then getting infused with gay liberation. And that there are two very different, that is that Marcuse's, and, and that Marcuse in contrast to Adorno, Marcuse in America, which may be part of the difference between them and Adorno in Germany, their relationship to the student movement is obviously very, very different. And Marcuse in certain ways became part of the student movement. One small anecdote about this, I was in Berlin West, then West Berlin in 1968, when the, the explosion took place in Paris of, of uh, radicalism in the streets. And Marcuse had been in Paris and he came to West Berlin and he spoke at a giant mass meeting uh, in the, the Freie Universität Auditorium Maximum. And he's up there talking and somebody asked him a question about the Vietnam War. And Marcuse goes into this long discussion of how important it is that the Soviet Union is giving aid to the Viet Cong and that we should not be anti-Soviet. And he was practically booed off the stage by the anti-authoritarian new left. So his relationship there was, that was funny. But that Adorno and Marcuse have, uh, I think that Mary B Jo Buell's chapter on, on Narcissus and the Frankfurt School and feminism and the new left is, is very instructive on this question of Marcuse and Adorno. <clears throat> yeah, I just want to interject something. It's it's important not to confuse uh, Adorno and Horkheimer as they were discussing Lenin in the 1930s with their experience as refugees in the 1940s, and then with their further uh, development in the in the 1950s and 60s. When I, I think by the end by the end they had pretty much come come to some kind of peace with, with American imperialism. That, that's all I can say about that. They, that, that po whatever, whatever political edge they had in, the, in, the, in their previous history was gone by the, by the, end, by the end. So uh, in that sense, their, their politics was very, very different than Marcuse's. But I wouldn't confuse that with, with their situation in New York in the 1940s. Uh, or, or their conversations in the 1930s. These are, these are different phases in their evolution. Thanks, Alex. Um, I'm gonna read out another question. Um, unless, unless anyone in the audience wants to ask a question, if you do, please raise your hand. Divya, I think Paul DeMarty had his hand raised for a while. 
during the prior exchange? Uh, that that was um, from the previous question. I just forgot to put it out. I'm, I'm not nearly qualified to uh, <laughs> weigh in on that one. But it was very, I was interested to hear the uh, kind of uh, answer. Great. All right. Um, so I'm going to read this, and this is about Adorno's negative dialectics. It's from um, Raffaella who asks, um, thank you for your wonderful discussion. In my understanding of Adorno, his stance with regard to his relation to Lenin is contradictory. On the one hand, he and Horkheimer claim that they are Leninists, but in his lectures on the negative dialectics as a problematic form of materialism uh, against dialectical materialism, he presents a critical form of materialism one which unpacked the dogmatic tendencies that infected philosophy, materialism included. This disagreement extended to the objective of dialectical materialism, which was a communist state. Adorno rejects the positive forms of utopia described in Marxism. My question is in relation to this rejection. Is the lack of commitment to a positive utopia detrimental to Adorno's political philosophy? May, may I jump in? Yes, please, Tom. Um, and I think sort of there's um, in in the discussions that the, there's between Adorno and Horkheimer, there's a whole bunch of stuff which I'm not sure I completely understand about how like Teddy, that's um, that's um, Adorno, uh, Adorno um, thinks that everything is going to be all right in the end. And you should base your revolutionary politics on the base on the, on the supposition that somehow everything is going to work out. And Horkheimer said, thinks that is the ideology of the parson. I think he puts it that way. Um, and that and he's much more he's much more um, 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 ne much more negative. So I, I, so so Adorno doesn't define this idea of a better emancipated future, but there is an undefined notion, um, hope that that basically um, he wants to hold hold on to. I think. Um, I think that the, from the point of view of radical politics, is uh, the problem is that um, you know Marxists Marxists are into imminent critique, right? And that the possibility that the the, um, the socialist future isn't going to be some kind of abstract idea um, that's sort of brought in from the outside, but it's somehow supposed to be. And a development that's imminent in history. So you have this line from Marx that communism is the real movement of history. Um, and I think that the problem for radical politics um, in Adorno and Horkheimer, in terms of basically connecting it to a Marxist politics, is that they completely deny that there is anything imminent in capitalism as it um, as it has developed that's going to basically, that, it, that constitutes communism as, as its real movement. Um, and I think that's the real challenge in terms of, of orchestra, of articulating a radicalism with Adorno and Horkheimer's theoretical commitments. Thanks, Tom. Um, I, unless Can someone... I add a footnote to that or is, yeah, let somebody please. else speak? No, Paul, if you wanted to um, take a stab at that, and then I'm going to take one question from the floor, and then your responses to that final question can be kind of your closing remarks. Yeah. Just, uh, but if you wanted to say something now, Paul, before we a, move a very small footnote uh, to what Tom Cannell has just said, it, it, referring back briefly to that uh, quotation from Marx in 1843 about theory. Um, uh, becoming a material force when it when it grips the masses. Um, in 1941, and the essay that I also referred to by Horkheimer, that's quite a bit later than eight, it's almost a century later. Uh, uh, that 
of then from Marx's piece, Horkheimer in this essay, The Authoritarian State, um, refers to the masses, uses the image of a catatonic patient. And his hope is, this is the, 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 re, the remaining life of the dream of theory gripping the masses. He said, my hope is that uh, the, the masses will like a, a catatonic patient who awakens from the, his or her trance and condition and will show that they understood what was going on all along. But right now we're trying to address the masses are catatonic. That is, this is a footnote to the idea of their sense of, of his sense of there is no determinate negation any longer. There's nothing imminent in capitalism that is going to provide a lever of transformation. So that's just a footnote to Tom's, I hope uh, an acceptable footnote to what Tom said. Thanks, Paul. Um, and I'm gonna turn to Will who has a question he's going to ask. Kevin, could you unmute Will? Hi, thanks, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, cool, I see my, my Zoom image is on. So I wanted to challenge some comments that were coming up in the opening comments about the idea of the Frankfurt Schoolers not being Leninists on the basis of not being in organizations. So this, this calls to mind, it, it sort of brings up a somewhat simple binary of Leninism equals organizationalism or something or movementism and the Frankfurt School somehow being anti-Leninists on that basis. But I was thinking about the very text that has sort of floated in the background of these discussions of Lenin as the party person is of course the 1902 what is to be done pamphlet. And in that pamphlet, he does he, he puts a lot of time into addressing movementism itself in terms of tailism. So he addresses the, the legal Marxists and the economists in terms of just following what is. And so there's a, there's a critique of this type of movementism in Lenin himself and then the following year at the RSDLP Congress, we see him um, putting this highly discerning uh, disc discriminatory conditions on who is a member of the party that leads to this split. So that's all to say, you know, it, it doesn't seem the case that si simply joining an organization constitutes Leninism in any serious way. And if that's the case, um, how can people respond to something Tom brought up in his opening remarks, which was that the Frankfurt School's emphasis on so-called cultural psychological issues is not so much an eternal position, but rather a function of change conditions and the lack of a kind of emancipatory politics. So that's my question is, what does it mean to really say that the Frankfurt Schoolers are not Leninist for not joining an organization? Thanks, Will. And as you respond to this, um, just, you know, um, this will be kind of your closing remarks as well. So um, whoever wants to go first, or we can go in the order that you all spoke, if you'd like. So Paul Damati, would you like to start us off? Uh, sure. Um, I think, yeah, it's been, a, it's been an inter interesting, uh, wide-ranging discussion. Um, I think on the last question obviously i mean it's kind of addressed to me because i said that um i think um the trouble is uh, i think uh, although uh, you know i i have trouble with problems with the way people define leninism with the sort of definitions that are traditional in in the um in when the stalinist tradition but also in the trotsky's tradition that i think alex belongs to um I think like at the very minimum, you just have to accept that if we're not talking about um, the organization of the working class into a proletarian party of some sort with some level of internal discipline, then, I, I, well, I don't know what's left apart from like materialism and imperial criticism, like that, is, you know, in, in terms of uh, the, 
the reason Lenin is an important figure in history is as the leader of the party movement. And, I'm, and I, I, the trouble I have with, with um, the, the sort of use, of use of that kind of name, apart from that thing, is it precisely it just becomes a kind of, it becomes a sort of Jungian archetype where Lenin is this kind is the guy who does things and, and is hard or something, but abstracted from any any actual details of, of, of his life. Um, I think you also get that invariance of the sort of cult of Lenin and the party of the new type stuff, to be honest. Uh, but uh, it's it's particularly problematic here because it just sort of floats free. I mean, I think we need some sort of heuristic for defining defining whether um, uh, uh, you know someone fits into a particular category. I mean, you you mentioned the sort of the the 1901-1902 kind of period. Um, I mean, it's worth recognizing that all these people were in the same party. Lenin didn't say there is no party and wait for one to sort of land from the heavens. You know, he was a member of the RSDLP and he engaged in very hard political polemics within it. And then at that Congress actually split three separate times. You know, the Bund walked out first and then um, then there's the split with the economists, and then finally the split within ISCRA, the, the, the split within the majority. So there's a sort of like the, the, the like you could you, yes, there there existed very deeply deformed political parties in 2030s Germany. Like you can join them, you can fight within them. Um, if you choose precisely saying, well, um, the the situation is bad, so we're going to go and to go off and do cultural research. Like, I, I cannot see a, a definition of Leninism of any kind that, that would sort of fit on me. It's, um, it, it, you do just end up with it as being like, well, I, he's a name that's admired or a hero or something, um, uh, which I think is sometimes a problem in Hegelian philosophy, the, the way that the, the roles are sort of by someone like Napoleon figures in like a, uh, Hegel's philosophy of history and so on. Um, what else should I just quickly on the other things? Um, uh, da, 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 da. Uh, so the utopia kind of negative dialectics, dialectical materialism stuff. I mean, I think there is my sense of what the having read about thirty percent of the ne negative dialectics. My sense of it is that the the underlying argument is about um, the way in which philosophical systems end up ex excluding. Um, material by definition by resolving to a kind of uh, I, um, position of identity um, and in that sense I think that kind of overlaps with what you might think the sort of traditional Marxist criticisms of sort of utopian socialism where uh, the world is kind of just the, the, the future world is just sort of posed over against the sort of current world so I don't think that's necessarily um, a, a difficulty in terms of like well does that prevent um, um, the sort of late Adorno from, uh, from being, um, you know, pertinent, I guess, to, uh, to people who are kind of active in the movement or something like that. Like, really, we shouldn't be doing all that stuff. We shouldn't have a, 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 a sort of complete, total philosophical system from which nothing can escape um, as, our, as the basis for our work, because that does end up creating a kind of circle of philosopher kings who were completely resistant to correction from the poor old ordinary workers on their motorcycles and what have you. Um, so I don't think that's necessarily fundamentally problematic. I think the negative dialectic stuff is kind of an interesting corrective, as, which is why I kind of cheekily posed it against Lukács there. I think um, it's, uh, it's worth uh, um, bearing that in mind. Um, I think most of, most of the stuff I think has been dealt with. Um, uh, I think, it, yeah, and I take Tom's point that you do sort of have to, uh, yes, Adorno and Horkheimer would not have, would have been working with the old you know, version of Leninism, you know, definition of Leninism circa 1930s or whatever. And we should kind of take them at their word, but then we have to think about what they, what they meant with them, what the status of this text is. Again, it's obscure notes from the mid fifties for planning a document that never appeared. Alters has a lovely quote that uh, we don't publish our own first drafts, but we sometimes publish other people's, um, which he means like people shouldn't publish new Marx texts that disprove my Marxology. But I think there is a real point there 
like if we want to talk, we want to take them at their word. Well, part of the part of taking them at their word means taking them at their word about what of their stuff is important, what did make it into the public sphere in lectures and writings and so on. I think that's an important distinction. Thank you, Paul. Um, and Paul Briner. With Will's question in mind, I was thinking of that um, in the 1880s, Engels, it was shortly before Marx dies, Engels writes a letter to Marx, 1881, 1882, and says something to the effect of, I was just walking down the street in Manchester and I saw a working class man wearing a used suit with a top hat and he had a dog on a leash and he's absolutely shocked by this. And it led to what Engels came to call the labor aristocracy this was developing. Not too long after that, Edward Bernstein in the German Social Democratic Party and Lenin uh, have a falling out, but they both agree that left to its own resources, the proletariat, even in Marx's sense, will not come to a consciousness of the need for a totalizing transformation of capitalism into a worker's state or communism. It won't come by itself. And Bernstein says, yes, that's right, it won't. That's why we have to drop the dream and look for reforms in the capitalist system. We have to work with labor unions. And Lenin says the same thing, the working class, but Bernstein is wrong. What we need is a kind of epistemological collective blowtorch to blaze into the consciousness of the working class, the necessity for total revolution. And that, Lenin says, will be the party, the, the, the party of professional revolutionaries. So I think that the conflation of the term Leninist and partyism, the answer to Will's question is that the conflation makes sense, that Leninism is organizationalism, it is partyism. Otherwise, it has attributes that are common to a lot of revolutionary socialists in the 20th century. I think um, there are alternatives. There's Rosa Luxemburg's position, which I think in certain ways may, it seems to me that is looking at a radical, if not revolutionary, hopefully revolutionary, but radical labor movement. That it is that it's only from the, industri the industrial and post-industrial working class that anything imminent or any determinate negation will come from. So there's the, the Luxembourgist position or the position of council communists, Paul Maddox Sr., the German Communist Labor Party of the post-war period, uh, those kind of perspectives. Anti-Leninist communism, it's not a bad idea. Thank you all very, very, very much. Thank you, Paul. Um, and Alex? Uh, <clears throat> um, yeah, uh, as I said in my opening remarks, the, uh, the kinship of Adorno and Horkheimer to Lenin depends on what you mean by Lenin and Leninism. And uh, yes, I do, I, I certainly believe that uh, an organization and a party has something to do with that. Uh, but again, I don't, I don't think that that part of the question is not really very interesting to me. Um, I, I would refer you to Horkheimer himself, who felt that the important thing about Lenin was his, uh, his attention to, uh, to the consciousness of the masses. Uh, it wasn't the words he used, I don't have them in front of me, but <clears throat> it was his attention to the subjective and, 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 uh, in the socialist project. And that is in fact, what does distinguish Lenin from, uh, from the minions of the second international who uh, were brought up and bred on a certain form of degraded Marxism, really a form of mechanical materialism that was espoused by Kautsky and Plakano. Uh, so, um, I, I think Lenin did represent a certain break from that. Again, not, not, not all at once. He certainly came out of that tradition, but he also broke from it. Um, 
And so to me, that, that's the, the interesting intersection is that. The, the actual politics of the Frankfurt School, I don't really consider it um, worthwhile to uh, even as a, uh, as a topic of investigation. I mean, you have, you have to say that uh, if, they, if they wound up where they were at the end of their careers, there, there must have been something pretty rotten to begin with that they, they that despite all their uh, sophistication, they never really questioned. And I, I and I, I think this is all related to to the idea that you can somehow develop a form of Marxism that's completely isolated from the struggles of the working class. So, and where, where I come back here is I'm looking at this from a practical point of view. What what is it a value, if any, that was was produced by critical theory? And I, I think it's that it's those insights that they develop into mass consciousness. And, and, that's, and that's a supremely practical issue for those who have not given up on the Marxist project. Thank you. <laughs> Alex and Tom. I mute myself. Um, I, I think, thanks to everybody. This, this, I've had a ball and I really uh, appre have really appreciated this experience. Um, I think that of all the panelists, it would be fair to say, that I am the one most accepting of the premises of the of the prompt um, that the, that Adorno and and Horkheimer had Leninists uh, had a certain Leninism. Um, I think, you, but even I would basically sort of acknowledge that that Leninism is problematic, and I think that the problematic nature of it lies in the. Um, in the differences between what a critical theorist should be and what a Leninist, Leninist party intellectual should be. Um, for the latter, I would refer everyone to, um, to James Cannon's um, um, struggle for a proletarian party, where he makes it clear that intellectuals um, need to submerge themselves to the party proletarian party milieu, and they need to have party patriotism, which involves in particular um, a proud, unrelenting propagation of the party platform, um, which which um, the Leninist Party, like like the CPGB, um, will will have. And um, I think there's a profound difference between being a party intellectual um, with, as a party patriot propagating the party platform from the activity of a critical intellectual who's trying to make sure that you don't lapse into conceptual self-identity, that you recognize the innate um, self-contradiction in, in all concepts. Those are two very different activities. And so the question of how the, the remaking of oneself that a critical intellectual would have to, a critical theorist would have to do to become a Leninist party intellectual is I think a really interesting thing to think about. Anyway, thank you guys so much. I really have had a ball. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone, uh, for being on this panel. And we'll post the recording on our YouTube channel soon. And I'll send the links out to you. Thanks very much. Thank you, Divya. Bye, everyone. Cheers, everybody. Bye-bye.